Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Steve Leswear, author of Life and Death on the Mormon Frontier. Um, we're going to talk more about the Frank Leswear and Gus Gibbons murders, and we're also going to talk about Butch Cassidy's Mormon background. Did you know he grew up in a Mormon community in Arizona? So we'll find out more about uh, some of his aliases and things like that. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Among the interesting characters uh, that we we meet uh, uh, along the way, besides the interesting outlaws, is the sheriff, um, uh, Edward Beeler, that he was uh, at the, he was born in 1864. So he was uh, 36 at this time, and he um, he was married to Mary Hamlin, who was uh, a daughter of Jacob Hamlin. You know the famed uh, recognize that name. yeah Mormon apostle to the Lamanites. Ed Beeler was not a Mormon. Uh, he was tall, handsome man, and she was uh, uh, you know people said she was you know uh, very good looking herself. But anyway, he was tall and he was uh, he was hard as nails kind of sheriff. Um, got along well with the Mormons, and uh, and very well liked as a sheriff uh, up to this point. But after the murders, um, uh, many townspeople uh, blamed him for uh, the young men having been left alone on the trail. And, uh, uh, and, and by all accounts, what I can read and by his actions, he blamed himself as well, felt really bad about hmm. it. And, after, and so after the, the boys were found... Um, he organized another posse, and he went on an obsessive two and a half month uh, chase for the outlaws, which is you know in the book this this chase. It's covered in newspapers, and and uh, and he ch and and of course he had other posse members with him, and he chased them in back into New Mexico, down into Mexico, up through New Mexico again. Uh, they killed another lawman in New. I'm surprised Pancho Villa is not in this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he's in another story of another side of my family. Oh, really? Yes, yes. That's um, your next book. Huh? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the Scousens. Oh, uh, uh, that uh, um, like Cleon Scousen. The Cleon Scousen. That that you His know. Ancestors. I, he's, uh, you know, my my grandfather Carl, the younger brother of of Frank. He married uh, a Scousen, uh, um, Merle Scousen, who was a daughter of Peter Scousen, who uh, went. And into the colonies with the Romneys and others, and so they oh. were down there with Pancho Villa. <laughs> uh, and my my grandmother was born in the year 1900 in those colonies. Oh, wow. um, but anyway, so yeah, they didn't they didn't get to Pancho Villa because this this is just 1900. But anyway, back up. Uh, uh, they killed another lawman in New Mexico. They chased him th up through Colorado into Utah, where they killed. Uh, the sheriff and his deputy from Moab, Utah, Ooh. which called out more posses. Uh, um, it was the largest manhunt in Utah up to that point in Utah history. And so it was two and a half months of chasing these outlaws. And, uh, uh, and among the things that, uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, I'm looking for uh, a quote from... From Ed Beeler, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so so Ed Beeler, you know, the, the, during his chase, he was interviewed at various times by newspaper uh, men from from Utah, and uh, about you know what he was doing, what he hoped to do, and uh, what he said about about this quest. He said that he said the boys that these cowardly villains shot to pieces in the South were my friends, and they sacrificed their lives to assist me, and I will even up the score. These fellows may as well fight me in one place as another, as the time when we meet is bound to come. I know them all, and I am as positive of their identity as though they were behind prison bars. So he was, you know, determined to get them. Hmm. He didn't, but uh, um, but that's that's because there's another thing of of, of reading about outlaws and and this event is it was very hard. To actually capture uh, capture outlaws, especially after say a robbery or something, or even this incident, you, you, the the posse's are traveling hours, even days behind. You know that the outlaws have a head start. The outlaws either have horses if it's a robbery, they have horses positioned along the trail, getaway trail, fresh horses. So they just race their horses, get on fresh mounts, and go. And the posse's can't catch them. Right. In this case, they had extra horses with them. The five outlaws. 
they were trailing 12 extra horses when they went through St. John's. So uh, Sheriff Beeler said that, you know, when they were chasing him, you know, it was, they had a running gun battle with them for a while after, after Saint, at Saint, near St. John's. He said, well, we'd shoot one horse, you know, they'd get the horses, and one horse would get shot, and they'd just jump onto a fresh one. And so they got away that, that first day from, from Sheriff Beeler um, uh, when he was chasing him for cattle rustling because the sheriff's horses gave out. Oh. And in fact, that's what happened to all of the posse men except for Frank and Gus, is their horses gave out. But anyway, back to how hard it was to chase the outlaws. The outlaws also, they had much better weapons typically than, than those chasing him. And posse members, as you said it, uh, when we talked about it, these were just regular people. They weren't gunmen. They weren't necessarily trained for tracking, any of that kind of stuff. And so, uh, uh, and there was always the threat of ambush. And so that posses had to you know, go slow and, uh, and then we're talking the West, vast mountain expanses and forests, places to hide. And, and then finally, uh, the outlaws often had associates and confederates, you know, at different places who were quite willing to hide them. You know, they got paid well for it. And uh, they would even lead the posses in the wrong direction. Oh, right. I saw them go that way. And yeah. so it was very hard to track down and, and actually capture people uh, after, uh, uh, after a robbery or after a murder. Mm -hmm. um, though the flip, there's a flip side to that too, which is this, that it was no picnic for the outlaws to be on the run. I mean, they were out in the elements uh, that, that uh, you know, it was cold or, uh, or hot and uh, lacking water, often food, you know, even almost starving to death sometimes. And so um, uh, it wasn't great being on the run. And uh, and in fact, you know, just a couple things. Uh, one is there was one of the outlaws in in my in my book. It wasn't one of the five, but an outlaw who comes into the picture later. Uh, he was in Montana being chased, and uh, it was during the winter. And so he, at night, to avoid being seen, he hid in he dig in snowbanks and he would hide in snowbanks. He nearly froze to death, you know, doing so, but it did work. He finally escaped. Uh, made it to Phoenix. Lost three fingers. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, he, he made it to Phoenix, Arizona, but he was only there a brief time because his prostitute girlfriend turned it turned him in for the thousand dollar reward. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, and then one other thing, another fellow by the name of Matt Warner, he, who was an, another Mormon outlaw, um, and and a, a outlaw pal of Butch Cassidy. Um, he, he went to prison for a number of years, came out, went straight. But anyway, in talking about, well, what was it like on the run? He said it was just terrible. He said, you didn't get any sleep. You know, you, you had to, uh, you know, when you tried to sleep, you had to have, you know, one ear and one eye open when you tried to sleep. And, uh, um, uh, and, and what else did he say? Oh, he, he said that, you know, he says, just after a while, you go crazy. He says that, that you know, even when you know you're perfectly safe, you know, you, you're just always uh, nervous. And, and, and what he said, it was really funny. He says, he says eventually, every piss ant under your pillow sounds like a posse, uh, um, like a uh, posse of sheriffs coming to get you. <laughs> <laughs> and and oh. so, so it was no, no picnic for them. And, uh, but anyway, also, you know, mentioned, oh, well, um, Matt Warner was another Mormon outlaw. Butch Cassidy, and the, uh, uh, some people know, but isn't always known. He, he came from a Mormon family. Right. His, his real name was Robert Leroy Parker. And uh, he was the oldest of 13 children. His parents, Maxie and Annie Parker, uh, came across the plains uh, with their families. They were as children uh, uh, in the 1850s, about the same time that the Lasuir family came. Okay. And they, uh, but anyway, the Parkers. Uh, Does set, the Lasuir family go to back to Nauvoo and everything? Uh, oh no, they um, uh, they were from the Jersey Islands. And so they came over. Like Jersey, England. Oh yeah, Jersey, England. Yeah, okay. off the coast in the in the English Channel, and um, and so they um, and so they came over in uh, 1852, uh, 54, 56, some, somewhere in that okay. that time frame. Um, so the perpetual but, immigration fund was that part of them? Oh, we, they um, they were not. They had a a a well off relative who paid for them oh. and and uh, to, to come over. Okay. So, um, uh, so yeah. So not with that. But anyway, uh, Butch Cassidy grew up uh, uh, in Circle Circleville, and uh, um, 
but it appears that uh, Mormonism never really took in him. <laughs> and he had a younger brother, Dan, who was also a bandit as well. Um, Is he the most famous Mormon outlaw? I think I think so. I think so. You know that that. Uh, um, I mean, next to Mark Hoffman. I yeah, guess. yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there, there, and there were a, a few, at least a, a, few, a couple in Arizona that I found. There was a Red Pipkin who was uh, well known in, in Apache County uh, itself. But in any case, yeah. So Butch was probably the, the uh, best known of them. I'd like to keep going, but I know I need to let you go. <laughs> Do you have any last thoughts before uh, you run? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I do. Just uh, a couple of things. Sure, uh, sure, a couple, a couple of things. First of all, um, uh, I'll, I'll end with an anecdote before I do a little conclusion. The mm -hmm. anecdote is this: that when um, Heber J. Grant, he was an apostle at this in the year 1900, and in January of 1900, so just a couple of months before. Um, this, uh, this event occurred, he and Apostle uh, Rudger Claussen uh, and um, J. Golden Kimball oh. were, were visiting for a conference in St. John's. And, uh, and so um, uh, Grant, uh, Apostle Grant, had been in this uh, little Colorado River quarter uh, in St. John's many times. He knew what it was like there. Elder Claussen had never been there before. So while they were in... in Rudger Klotzen, is that who this is? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, he was an apostle too. He was an apostle too, yeah. And so they were there for a conference, they were visiting, and, and they were in Holbrook waiting, uh, the train had taken them to Holbrook, and from there they were going to take a carriage to St. John. So while they were waiting, um, uh, Elder Klotzen was was sort of marveling at, at, at you know, what he was seeing of these places, and he, and, and he said he wondered how the saints ever found all these nooks and corners to settle. Elder Claussen, who had never, you know, visited this region before, was marveling at at just these places, and 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 uh, uh, and he said uh, he turned to Elder Grant and he said he said I wonder how he wondered how the saints ever found all these nooks and corners to settle, and uh, Elder Grant turned to him and said, Well, when you see them, you will wonder how they live there. <laughs> <laughs> and and so um, the title of my book, you know, is. Uh, life and death on the Mormon frontier. Right, and so it's it is about, it's about the murders and the, the circumstances surrounding it and the chase and the outlaws. But um, it's ultimately it's more than just the murders. You know, it's it's a story of of faith and uh, hardship and perseverance and also greed and violence and and death. Uh, and then, but then also you know the, this community. You know, finding joy in community and and comfort in faith. And then ultimately, the people trying to find meaning in in these deaths, as well as meaning in life. And so that would be my final word on the book. And you know, hope people find uh, the same meaning in my book as I as I did in well, researching and writing it. You know, it's good because I know, you know, the Mormons. We've lived in the Wild West, but I haven't really had any Wild West stories on here. So this is a this is going to be new, and I'm I'm glad to. Here's, even though it's kind of a terrible story with the murders, but you know that's what the Wild West was all about. Yes, yes, and and you know I didn't touch on it, uh, but one of the things aspects about this book uh, is is that uh, and and the reason why we in the Lasweer family always knew this about these murders is for uh, is that James Lasweer, Frank's older brother, when he came back from his mission, he uh, uh, shortly after. He got back. He reported that he had a vision of Frank in the spirit world oh. preaching the gospel uh, to the spirits there, and um, and he said he saw a young woman standing next to Frank, and and the guardian angel who was showing him around the uh, spirit world uh, let James know that this young woman was to be Frank's wife. Oh wow! And and so then, uh, you, you know, when he awoke from his vision, he told his parents. It was readily believed. And then uh, a few days later, and this is James wrote this account in church magazines and private accounts. Uh, he said that a, a few days later, a woman from Concho, uh, a nearby town about fifteen miles away, her name was Olena Kemp. She came and said, told the Lasweer. Uh, family or the parents, she said, my daughter, Jenny, just died. And on her deathbed, she told me that Frank LeSueur had come to her 
in oh. a vision and said that they were to be sealed together. Wow. And, and so she asked the Swears that they be sealed together. So JT, the parents, JT and Geneva, called in James just to see what he thought. And he said, well, show me a photo. The woman had a photo and he said, that's the woman I saw in my vision. Wow. And so they were subsequently sealed together wow. in temple uh, ceremony. So f for us and, f well, for that family and for all of us subsequently, um, that was the story. That's why we knew this story was was the outlaws for us were the bit players. They were the extras in this story of faith and and God's goodness and 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 you know saving power, uh, and and of course uh, it reinforced Mormon beliefs about the spirit world and right. the truthfulness of the church. In my research for this book, as it turns out, the story wasn't quite like James told it. <laughs> what? And and in fact, the, some of the Kemp family didn't like the way he told it. And, you know, and, and for example, you know, well, I found, I was just looking for, oh, who was this Jenny Kemp? Well, as it turned out, she was not dead. She didn't die until uh, more than two years later after Frank died. And her mother did not come to the Lasweers. They came to her and she at first um, declined and said, no, Jenny died mine and I'm going to keep her mine. And, and, uh, so in any case, that story is in here as as well. Uh, so there was no ceiling. Uh, there was a ceiling, but it didn't quite happen like James said. Oh, okay. And so if you want to know how it happened, you have to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> but but so in any case, and 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 not surprisingly, at the funeral, and we have the minutes of the funeral for these boys for Frank, for Frank, Frank and Gus. Gus. It was a dual funeral that. Um, the, the speakers were already saying they were called to another mission that uh, uh, and and Gus's own fam Gus's father uh, in, in their family they say that he had a vision uh, where, where or not a vision he said that uh, Gus appeared to their father and explained to him he was killed so he could be a missionary to the um, uh, Gibbons family in the in the spirit world. Oh, okay. And so I take a chapter to discuss this issue as well as Mormon theology and theology that precedes this because in fact uh, the Mormons weren't the first to talk about preaching in the spirit world. The uh, Universalists and the Shakers, you know, prior to the Mormons also oh. had very similar beliefs as it turns out. So anyway, I take a chapter to explore that. Um, but that's also why the book is about um, finding meaning in death as well as finding meaning in life. Well, very good. All right. Well, Steve Lesware, I appreciate you coming here all the way from Virginia. Yeah. And uh, thanks for being here on Gospel Tangents. Oh, you're very welcome. I enjoyed it. I hope your audience enjoys it as well. Yes. Get your, get your Wild West book. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Steve Lesware, author of Life and Death on the Mormon Frontier. So uh, he talks about the murders of Frank Lesware and Gus Gibbons by the Wild Bunch. So Steve, thank you so much for coming out here to Utah. It was good to get together in person and, uh, and talk about your latest book. So it's a lot of fun. In our next conversation, we're going to move on to Dr. Bat Matt Bowman. Now, you may know him as one of the authors of The Mormon Bigfoot and UFOs. And, and I think, you know, these sorts of stories, these, uh, um, this folklore, this supernatural folklore that people find kind of fascinating and interesting and all of that, we find it fascinating and interesting uh, because it appeals to us, because it tells us something about who we are, really. You know, there's, there's a sense of being edgy when you think about Bigfoot, when you think about UFOs, but these things catch on, and they catch on for reasons, because they resonate with something um, that we want to think about ourselves. And that's kind of the argument of the article, right? I'm, you, you say, right, the notion that Bigfoot is Cain or vice versa, Cain is Bigfoot. Um, I argue in the article that this is an association that really um, emerges in the 1980s. Right. Um, in the kind of Mormon corridor, right? Idaho down through Arizona. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at gospeltangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospeltangents or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com 
and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.